Uh, Please turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 121. A song of ascents. I lift my eyes toward the mountains. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He'll not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. The Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going, both now and forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where will my help come from? Is there anyone in this room who has not asked that question at some point? Where will my help come from? You might ask that question in natural disaster, in drought, in fire, in flood. You might ask that question in the face of something completely unexpected, perhaps a relationship breakdown. You might ask that question faced by the humdrum of everyday life where it just seems to unfold in a level of greyness into the future. Where will my help come from? Is there anyone who has not asked that question? Now, I don't think there's any more relevant question any day, but especially at the end of one year and moving into another. Especially at the end of one decade. Did you know that? We're finishing a decade and into another. We're surrounded by historic events on a day like today, aren't we? The end of one year, the start of another coming, the end of one decade, the start of another coming. Uh, Closer to home, the worst drought in living memory. The worst fires in living memory. And then even closer to home, you've all got all sorts of personal historical markers around your life. With all those markers... All those lines in the sand. Could there be any more relevant question? Where will my help come from? Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thank you that we can open it. Thank you for those men and women who wrote these songs and poems. Thank you that your people have sung them. Thank you that today... We can join with that choir over the centuries who have sung songs like Psalm 121, who have asked this question and received your answer. Father, apply that answer to us today. Amen. Map point two on the outline. I know uh, Psalms are one of people's favourite books. Uh, Let me tell you, I find it one of the hardest books in the Bible. I think it's a really tough book. Uh, It's not tough because of the content necessarily, though the content's pretty hard at points, isn't it? Uh, I think it's tough because for a bloke like me who likes solid, concrete things, there's no history here, is there? We're not given any events. Uh, Even sometimes the authors are a best guess. We're given no circumstances for how these poems and songs came about. There's no real context. I struggle with that because I can't place it. I can't put it in a box. There's no draw for me to slide it out and slip it into. But we are given some indicators, aren't we? Uh, When we flick through these poems, we know they're poems and songs. They're a reaction to everyday life in God's world, a a broken world. Like most songs and poems, there's a level of deep emotion behind them and in what they express. Uh, We know that they were used uh, as the hymn book for God's people when they met. We've got mission praise. They had the book of Psalms. And when they gathered together, and we'll think about that in a moment in the temple, and we'll think about that in a moment, they opened this book and they sang it. It was their hymn book. And we know that they are God's word. We've just said that, haven't we, But out of Timothy? So whatever else is going on here, this is part of God's unfolding revelation of what he's doing in a really mucked up world. Psalm 121 has two other indicators. Uh, If you've got it there, open in front of you, you'll see that there's a little section of italics under the heading. Those italics are important. They're they're actually scripture. 
part of the Bible. Say, so here's a random Bible reading hint. When you read the Bible up the front, always read the italics in the Psalms. That's Bible. It's a song of ascent. Uh, you'll notice as you glance around on those pages that there are a number of them. There's 15 of them. A lot of debate about what this means. I'm so thankful I didn't do Hebrew, so I can't enter into the debate. But I'm told that they are at least the songs sung by God's people as they came together in Jerusalem. They were told to do that three times a year by God in the book of Exodus. Three great festivals. Festivals connected with salvation out of Egypt and slavery. Festivals connected with planting and harvesting. And so as they all gathered into Jerusalem from all parts of the land, everyone there in that one city, as they all came up to the temple on the top of the hill in the middle of Jerusalem, they sang these songs. Can you imagine that? A million people walking up the hill singing these songs. A million people walking down the hill singing these songs. Wouldn't that be marvellous? And they came for fellowship, to hang out, to dwell with God and his mob in the temple. And the second hint we have is that whilst this song would have been sung around this time, we've got to make a decision. Was it sung going up or going down? Now, you might think that's ministers are paid to split those hairs, but it's an important question. Was this a song they sang as they prepared or was this a song they sang as they'd been prepared? I reckon it's a song they sang as they left, as they went back to their lives. Other festivals could have lasted a week. You know what it's like, a week of good fellowship, good food, reading the Bible together, singing and spending time with people, your family, your household, and then you've got to go home. And you've packed everything up and you've done the head count. You're ready to go out of Jerusalem and you raise your eyes to the hills around. And you go, I'm, I'm going out into the broken world. Where's my help going to come from now? And all this took place around the temple. Well, we've heard about the temple, haven't we? We know that it's that massive, huge, astounding building in the middle of Jerusalem on a hilltop. It's a symbol, a symbol of what God has given his people. It's a symbol of three truths in particular. The first is this, God wants to live with his mob. He's got no greater desire than in living with his mob so the world will see who God is. And so this building has been built as a type of house, as a road sign, as a picture of what God desires of what God wants. And that means that it's also a picture of two other things, isn't it? It's a picture of a problem. The problem isn't, I can't fit God into this house. The problem is, I don't want God in my house. The Bible's got a name for that, doesn't it? It's called sin. In my house, there's only one boss, and that's me. Not God. And so it's very hard Impossible for God to live with his people, isn't it? Because they don't want to live with God. And so in this symbol, this building, you see the problem because what happens when you come up? You see sacrifices, don't you? Where animals die, taking the judgment humans deserve for rejecting God. Where do they take place? In that temple, don't they? And as you see that problem lived out and as you smell it, as you smell the blood and as you hear the sounds, you also confront the solution, don't you? The solution that somehow God has made a way for us to live with him because that animal is taking my judgment. Now you and I know that no amount of lambs can pay for your life. So you know that's a symbol a picture of what God can, will and desires to do for his people, to make a way where he can live with them, where their sin is rightly judged and dealt with, where someone is a substitute for all of us, for all of God's people. So for the Jews, for God's people, the temple is a historical marker, a symbol 
of what God desires, the problem we all face, and the solution that God works. And so as they leave that gathering together at one of those three festivals, as they leave that historical marker, there's a natural question as they go out into the broken world. I lift my eyes towards the mountains. Where will my help come from? You've got to imagine it, don't you? I want you to imagine it. I want you to imagine that you're part of that million odd people who've gathered together for a festival. You've seen people that you've not seen for months, maybe even years. You spent a week together, eating together, catching up together, celebrating God's provision. You've sung songs and you've prayed prayers and people have read the Bible to you and taught you. You've had encouragement over a number of days, formal and informal. And now you're packed up and you're going home. And you're at the city gate and you look back at that temple, that historical marker of everything that God desires, the problem in your heart and the solution that he's worked out pointing forward and you've got to go back into the broken world. It's a natural question, isn't it? Where's my help going to come? It was easy this week. (laughs) Where's my help coming from? The answer is given immediately, isn't it? Look look there in verse 2. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Immediately you give yourself the answer. Do you notice that? I know that answer. Do you notice something in particular about that answer, about the name given to God? Because this is a first hint. It's the Lord in capitals, is it? We know what that means. That's God's personal name for his personal mob. That's the name that God reveals when he says, I'm committed to you. You've just spent a week remembering that gathered together. And so as you leave the city in one word, one name for God, you give yourself a rapid history lesson, don't you? You remind yourself that you're part of God's people. You remind yourself that you're in God's land. You remind yourself that you've been at that symbol of everything God desires. You remind yourself that there is a big promise standing behind this, isn't it? Remember that promise given to that bloke up in Babylon? The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house, to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That's the big promise, isn't it? I'm going to roll back sin. I'm committed to this broken world where people don't want me. I'm going to do it through a particular family. And as you leave this festival, as you pack up to go home, you remember that God has got a promise, I will roll back sin. And that lies behind your help. You also remember something else about God. Did you see that there in verse 2? Whatever else you're going to experience, he's the creator. Not only has he committed to the broken world, he made the world. None of what you experience in this world as you walk down out of Jerusalem, down that dusty road, back to that home as you unpack, none of what you experience will be beyond the creator, broken as it may be. And so the question's answered, isn't it? Where will my help come from? My help will come from the God who has committed to rolling back sin, my help will come from the one who made it in the first place. And then the language changes, doesn't it? Did you notice that in verse 3? Look down there in verse 3. It goes from I or my to you. It's like it's a duet. I've, I've sung the first verse and second verse and then someone pipes up as I walk out of the temple and says, hey, let me reassure you. Let me just unpack that for you. It might have been the priest might have been one of the temple helpers. It might even be someone in your own travelling party. But they want to reassure you. And all of these reassurances are connected with the repetition of one key word. Uh, In our translations, it's connected with protect. But uh, let's go with a shorter word. It's really keep. Uh, Six times in verses 3 to 8. Keep, 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 keep. Can't avoid it, can you? You've got a keeper. You've got someone who will keep you. In fact, verses 3 to 4, God will keep his people. 
He'll not allow your foot to slip. Your protector will not slumber. Indeed, the protector of Israel does not slumber or sleep. God's committed to a mob, to a community. And through that community, as we've just been reminded, he's going to do something for the world. God's committed to the people of God. All the other gods in that region had to have nana naps. Did you know that? Every evening they had to go to bed. Then you had to wake them up in the morning. God doesn't sleep. God is so committed to his people that he is relentless. He's untiring. God just keeps on going on. He never stops in his commitment, in his protection of his mob. And because of that, he'll then keep each individual member. Verses 5 and 6, the Lord protects you. The Lord is a shelter right by your side. The sun will not strike you by day or the moon by night. The imagery is important, isn't it? Whether there's sun or moon, who's standing next to you? God is. Whether the sun's rising or the sun's setting, who's standing next to you? God is. Whether the sunscreen works or doesn't, whether the sleeping tablets work or doesn't, who's right next to you? God is. God will not only protect his mob, but he'll protect the members of his mob. He's unlimited. He's unlimited in his energy. He's unlimited in his time. He's unlimited in his effectiveness. He works both day and night. Which means, thirdly, in verses 7 to 8, time is not a barrier for God. The Lord will protect you from all harm. He will protect your life. The Lord will protect your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I'm limited by time. It's usually three meals a day. I know what time that is. God's not limited by time. God goes forever, which means his commitment is forever which means he is relentless forever, which means he will keep forever, which means when you leave that temple, when you go out from the gathering of God's people, when you are already wearied by the world and the prospect of going back to work and back to that same old house and back to that same old routine, there is some reassurance, isn't there? We'll slip on the road down from Jerusalem. God doesn't. We'll sleep that night, God won't. We'll get sunburned, God won't. We'll feel lonely in the deep hours of the night, but God is right there. We die, God doesn't. We age, God never does. We are dry, but God is vibrant and alive. What a reassurance. What a reassurance. It does raise a slightly awkward question, though, doesn't it? What help is there if you're not in God's mob? That's an awkward question, isn't it? What help is there if you're not in God's mob? Now, for God's people, the temple was that marker. I'm at point four on the outline. Uh, It was that historical symbol, a public display that showed everything that God was committed to. It showed his desire to live with his people. It showed the problem that he was then going to solve. Uh, It was not his home. Solomon recognised that as he dedicated the temple. It was not a lucky charm. It was a symbol of God's desire, plan and commitment to one day live with his mob, to deal with human sin and to deal with it in a way that humans didn't deserve in grace And so as you walked out of the temple, that historical marker was always there. That marker was there. God is your keeper. For God's people, that's always been a reassurance. The Lord is our keeper. Do you think it was any different for Jesus? He's one of God's people, isn't he? That's why we have the genealogies that we looked at this year in Matthew and Luke. He's connected to Abram's family. Jesus would have gone up three times a year to the festivals. We have accounts of that, don't we, in the Gospels? He would have sung Psalm 121. He knew the temple. He knew what it stood for. Just read John chapter 2. 
Jesus knew Psalm 121. I, I actually reckon if you flip through the Gospels, you'll see Psalm 121 everywhere, won't you? When Jesus is given viable alternatives by the devil after his baptism, where does he turn? He turns to his keeper. When there are at least one or two instances where the crowd wants to grab him and crown him, what does Jesus do? He withdraws to the wilderness and turns to his keeper. When he faces relentless opposition that aims to kill him, Jesus clings to the relentless God who wants to sustain him. In his final moments before his arrest, as he prayed in the garden, as he prepared to enter the brokenness of the world in all its fullness, who did he cling to? His keeper. And when he was raised from the dead, who did he cling to? His keeper. When he entrusts his spirit, where does he deposit it? With his keeper. And when God raised Jesus from the dead, in that reading that we had from Ephesians, we saw that his keeper did not fail. He displayed his desire, I will dwell with my mob because this one has paid for their sin and I have raised him from the dead to show that the solution has been wrought. God is the keeper of Jesus. And so we've now got a historical marker, don't we? It's Jesus, isn't it? He's our historical marker that we look to, that we're connected with. I think that's why those last few words of Romans chapter 8 are so important. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is where? In Christ Jesus our Lord. No time machine can undo that historical fact, can it? Nothing can wipe away the cross. There is our historical marker that reassures us we've got a keeper. Now, as we finish one year, I'm at point five on the outline, as we start another, as we finish one decade, as we start another, I reckon at least in the next seven days, every one of us will say, where will my help come from? Every one of us. For God's people, that question has an answer. We have a keeper who is the maker of heaven and earth, who is our God, whose certain commitment is displayed in the historical marker of Jesus Christ, crucified and raised. We've got a keeper, someone who will keep us. If you are not part of God's people, how can you answer that question? Because let me tell you, you'll get sunburnt this week. You might be lonely this week. You will need to sleep this week. You will need to shop for groceries this week. Your life will be dictated by time this week. If you are not part of God's people, where is your answer? If you are, the answer is very clear. Cling to that marker. <laughs> that is our keeper. Now, that doesn't answer all of our questions, does it? Do you notice that the psalm never says life will be cruising? Do you notice that the psalm never says you will have no brokenness? It does say your life will be protected by your keeper. We are reassured that as we cling to our keeper, our keeper has already clung to us, has already done for us what we could not do. And that keeper does not slumber, he does not sleep, he does not rest, he is relentless. He's not hindered by day or night, by life or death. He will keep his people in everything they need to be his people. Out of that, in 2020, there can be deep contentment, can't there? A satisfaction 
that we have what we need to be God's people. Did you hear what I said then? We have what we need to be God's people. There is deep contentment in that. There's deep confidence, isn't there? This guy's better than Tim Payne. He's a keeper. He'll not let a catch drop. He'll not lose his temper. He'll not go dry. No time will mark him out. He is our keeper. There's a deep commitment, isn't there? A commitment in community. We are a mob together navigating a world in which God has committed to rolling back the brokenness. Where does my help come from? Cling to that historical marker of Jesus Christ, our God, our maker and our keeper. Let me pray. Dear God, thanks for your word. Thanks for Psalm 121. We don't know who wrote it, but it is marvellous. We know that you inspired it and that is wonderful. Father, thank you that you are our keeper because in Jesus your deepest desire, our problem and your solution have all been publicly displayed and fulfilled. Thank you that in Jesus Christ we are reassured that you are our keeper. Father, please keep us. In Jesus' name, amen.